Um, but my name is Jasper Collier and I'm the Oral History Project Manager for Humanities DC, the State Humanities Council for Washington DC. Today's program will be recorded and the recording will be made available on Humanities DC's YouTube channel. Thank you for joining us for this month's edition of the DC Oral History Collaborative Coffee Chat. The Coffee Chat highlights the work of those working to document and preserve Washington's stories through oral history. The DC Oral History Collaborative began in 2017 as a partnership between Humanities DC, the DC Public Library, and the DC History Center. Its overarching goal is to encourage DC residents and communities to tell their stories through oral history. The Collaborative has sought to achieve this by surveying existing collections of DC oral histories, providing free public training opportunities, and by offering grants that are supported by additional training and mentorship. Uh, to date, the collaborative has supported through its grant programs over 50 projects across the city that have collected nearly 300 individual interviews. Almost half of these have been added to the People's Archive at the DC Public Library, where they are accessible through the library's catalog of digital resources, Dig DC. And I'll make sure to put a link to that uh, catalog of resources in the chat in just a bit. Uh, this month's conversation will be moderated by Dr. Amanda Huron. In 2019, Dr. Huron created an oral history project called Experiments in Housing Organizing in 1970s Washington, D.C., under which she has now interviewed 14 pioneers and leaders in the housing organizing movement. Today, she will be joined on the panel by two narrators from that project, along with two current advocates for tenants' rights. Dr. Huron is an associate professor of interdisciplinary social sciences at the University of the District of Columbia. She teaches courses and conducts research in housing politics, urban geography, and DC history. She is a native of Washington, DC. Uh, throughout uh, this morning's program, please feel free to use the chat uh, for any sort of comments that you have, anything you'd like to add to the conversation. Uh, when we get to the um, discussion portion or the um, audience discussion portion towards the end, please uh, try to use the Q&A if you have some questions that you actually want to ask our panel, um, and we'll uh, make sure to get those, uh, get those answered. Uh, but with that, I'll turn things over uh, to Amanda to introduce the panel and start the program. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Jasper. And thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, thanks to the panelists and to all the participants. Um, we're really excited to have you with us here today and be part of this conversation. Um, it's especially great to see among the participants other people who have done oral history projects through the DC Oral History Collaborative. Um, at least one other person who I interviewed as part of this project is here with us as a as a um, attendee, which is awesome. Um, I see at least one of my students from UDC here and other <laughs> folks who are engaged in tenant organizing in the city right now. So it's awesome. This is a great group. I'm super excited. Um, so I'm very grateful to have with us today um, Linda Leakes, Benito Diaz, and Maria Beatriz Valdez, who participated in the Oral History Project. Um, that were so gracious as to be agree to be interviewed by me over the past couple couple of years, and also to have Mary Regalado and Awad Bilal, who are both currently working as tenant organizers at the Latino Economic Development Center right now. Um, I think for me, oral history, um, you know, I wanted to do this project because I just wanted to get a bunch of these stories recorded and it just seemed really important to have this history recorded. Um, but I'm also really interested in thinking about how does this history help inform current efforts, current efforts to organize, because as we know, um, we are, <laughs> we're still in a crisis of housing in the city um, and thinking about how these experiences from 30, 40, God, nearly 50 years ago can help us think about what we're doing today. Um, so that was really kind of the impetus for putting for the project in the first place. And then, so that's why I'm so excited about this panel. So we're gonna begin um, by listening to short clips from my interviews with Linda and then Benito and then Beatriz. I'm gonna give a, a brief introduction to each of those clips to kind of provide the context. Um, then we'll hear the clip, it's about two or three minutes each one. Um, and then we'll move into a discussion among our panelists that I'll moderate. We've already discussed, the six of us, um, a bunch of things we want to talk about. Um, and I think I'm excited to hear those things come out today. And then we definitely want to reserve a chunk of time towards the end for more discussion with all of you who are here today. And please also, please feel free to put questions in the Q&A throughout. Uh, we really want that. We want your questions to help guide this discussion. And then also any other thoughts, reactions, commentary, you can put in the chat. That would be great too. 
So let's launch into these clips. Um, and as you listen to these clips, you know, just notice what reactions you might have, what questions they might raise for you. So I'm going to introduce the first clip. This is um, from my interview with Linda Leakes. So Linda Leakes was born in 1948 and grew up in St. Petersburg, Florida. She moved to DC in 76 or 77 because she wanted to live in a majority black city, but she couldn't handle the cold of a place like say Detroit. So mm -hmm. in DC, she became a tenant organizer initially through organizing in her own building in the Shaw or close to downtown neighborhood, um, sort of Southern Shaw right near downtown in DC. She then went on to work as an organizer with a group called Washington Inner City Self-Help or WISH. Um, and there she organized among public housing residents and she also helped tenants of privately owned buildings buy their houses collectively and form limited equity co-ops. So in the clip we're gonna hear, Linda talks about getting thrown out of the public housing office downtown <laughs> when she was there <laughs> agitating with a group of tenants and why it's important for low-income tenants to make their own demands. So let's listen to that clip. And, um... I remember one time I got thrown out of <laughs> the uh, public housing office. And when was that office? It down to where it is now, but it was no, it was nothing like what it looks like now. I forgot where it was located. I forgot where it was located. But anyway, so I was in there and. Uh, might have been North Cap I think it was North Capital, but nothing like it is today. <laughs> and um, with the residents and assisting them. And so somebody realized that I was assisting them <laughs> and asked me to leave. And I said, no, I'm not leaving. You know. <clears throat> and um, so they had the guard come, a guard came and grabbed me and pushed me out, <laughs> pushed me out the building, you know, and um, of course I was telling the folks to stay in there, telling the residents to stay in there, you know, as I was being forced out. And they did, they stayed in there and said what they needed to say, which was, all right, okay, throw me out, they the resident. I wasn't going to, I don't say anything anyway. I never say anything. It's never me, because my whole philosophy has always been to teach the folks who are directly impacted how to raise their voices. Uh, I mean, that was the, that was, uh, that's always been uh, my philosophy, but that was also the philosophy of uh, WISH, Washington Inner City. So our job was to go in and organize them to raise their voices and make demand, their own demands. <clears throat> and so that's what so that's what I did. So okay, you throw me out. You don't realize that you're not, you know, you're not stopping the folks taking over and saying what they need to say. <laughs> Thank you, Linda. All right, we're gonna move to the next clip, but let's keep in mind what we've heard, um, and we'll we'll discuss as a whole. So we're moving on to Benito Diaz now. Benito was born in San Juan, Puerto Rico, in 1950. He grew up in Philadelphia and San Juan and moved to DC in 1968 um, in order to go to college at George Washington University. Um, but he was also attracted to DC because he wanted to learn about the civil rights movement um, and because his aunt lived here. So he knew he had a free place to live. Benito founded the Adams Morgan Tenant Union in the early 70s with Maria Beatriz Valdez and others. He later worked as an organizer at a few different organizations before landing as a tenant organizer at WISH um, with Linda in 1987. So in this clip, Benito talks about his vision for organizing tenants along the model of the labor movement and how that vision informed the work of the Adams Morgan Tenant Union. I probably, I, I, I know somewhere, I have uh, an issue paper that I wrote. Um, talking about the need to organize tenants based on the model of the labor movement, which meant to me not just um, in general, but very concretely, you should organize um, tenants by landlord. 
not just independent buildings. Because what I saw in my experience from the jump was that here you got, you know, one tenant association over here, one tenant association over there. They ain't got no relationship to each other. Just like different unions, they ain't got no relationship to each other. Uh, but they all have to, different, you know, <laughs> you, you might even have four unions in one shop. You know, and they ain't got no relationship, and they compete against each other. You know, and and you have um, the same. You know, um, different. You know, at different shops, all owned and run by the same capitalist, and um, and you know, landlords is nothing but a capitalist, um, and so you have different tenants associations of buildings owned and managed by different build, uh, landlords. So for instance, uh, I focused, well, what we did was we f formed for a short while, not long, but um, a, the, the first local. It was based on the concept of locals of the same landlord and or management company. So we formed the H&M local. So, and H&M was a super uh, famous slumlord at the time. Like for instance, I lived at 2611 Adams Mill Road that was owned and managed by H&M. All the buildings on that block, on that side of the street, were managed by um, H&M. And across the street, 2630 was owned and managed by H&M. I could be wrong about that, but more or less. You know, and so, so I lived at 2611, then there were two other buildings, and then uh, on the corner of, I guess it was Lanier, was another um, building, H&M. They had a tenants association uh, that was led by Daisy Fernandez. And so she, and that eventually became um, a, uh, a co-op. Yeah. Great. Um, thank you, Benito, for that. And we're going to hear our third clip now. Um, from Maria Beatriz Valdez. Maria Beatriz Valdez was born in 1950 in Alamosa, Colorado, growing up in a long-standing Hispanic community there. She moved to DC in 1972 to be part of the first class at the Antioch School of Law, which was then a brand new law school founded by Jean and Edgar Kahn that was devoted to fighting poverty. Antioch School of Law was later fo folded into the University of the District of Columbia and today is the David A. Clark School of Law at UDC, um, which is still known for its reputation for training um, activist and anti-poverty lawyers. So while in law school, Beatriz um, helped found the Adams Morgan Tenant Union with Benito and others to help tenants know their rights and organize. And in this clip, Beatriz reflects on her work and emphasizes that tenant power lies in their strength in numbers. And that the strength in numbers you cannot get away strength in numbers. The system serves the wealthy. And the only thing that those of us who don't have the power and the wealth are numbers. Um, and it's a little harder now if people aren't paying rent to threaten a rent strike. Essentially, they're, they have less leverage. So it has to be more people involved, more people pushing. Um, and in some cases, you know, your bigger landlords maybe can, can take it more, but some of your small landlords uh, probably don't have a lot of options. And so how do you partner with them to find solutions that are mutual? Again, numbers, even if you have to cross the landlord-tenant line to work on mutual solutions. All right, thank you, Beatriz. So let's launch into first a discussion, anything, I'm curious for any of you, if our panelists, if anything that you heard 
um, you know, if you want to sort of react to anything that you heard, or if you have any follow up questions based on anything you heard just in these opening clips. I'll, I'll, I'll start. One of the things that I remember of what Benito referred to was the, the landlord were the Bernstein brothers, and they owned several buildings. And um, Amtu, Benito, uh, Luis, and I had made the news as tenant organizers, and the brothers heard about us, so they banned us from their buildings. We were not, they, we were not allowed to go to their buildings uh, to organize. And at that time, we were organizing... Uh, Sometimes the meetings were being held in lobbies. Well, the landlord had the right to ban us from common property, but he didn't have, they didn't have the right to ban us from individual apartments. The tenants who paid that rent had control over who was present. So we switched our meetings to um, tenant apartments. And that was one way that, that we got around it. But again, it was important to organize um, uh, the tenants of multiple buildings owned by the same brothers and to try to get some strength and power and to have in tenants in one building talk to who had were maybe more advanced in the progress of the rent strike talk about their experiences with the tenants in another building that was much more effective uh than having one of us uh talk about that uh process That's great. And I actually, that actually, um, Beatrice takes us to one of the first questions that we've gotten from the audience. And I think, you know, when you were clear, we heard from you, <clears throat> you were reflecting really on um, the rent strike as a, as a tactic um, for in, in, in your tenant organizing work. And so I'm <coughs> curious um, if any of the folks, Benito, Linda, Beatrice, if you want to talk some about your work, helping um, tenants, supporting tenants, helping organizing tenants who are who were um, undergoing rent strikes and what some of those challenges were maybe, um, but also some of what victories came out of that. Benito, I'll defer to you first. You know, um, I think all of us have participated or helped organize a whole bunch of uh, rent strikes. I know I got started in tenant organizing in my own building as a, as a rent. We, we started a rent strike. That's, that's, you know, up here at the, the Park Towers, the famous Park Towers across from Malcolm X Park. Um, but through that experience, I would, I'm not trying to tell people not to go on rent strike. But I think that uh, history uh, of experience tells us that maybe we need to rethink that somewhat and be more deliberate before we go down that route. And that is because, and, and maybe this only pertains to DC a bit, or and maybe other places as well, but based on the particular laws that are in place, um, then maybe, the, um, you know, the best tactic. And the reason I say that is for two basic reasons. Number one, when you go on rent strike, that means you're going to go to court. And when you go to court, that means you need to get a lawyer. And when you get a lawyer, not necessarily, but I bet you in 99% of the cases, to a very large extent, organizing stops. So now it's about the lawyers. So now the tenant lawyer is gonna play games with the, um, the landlord lawyer and the tenants are gonna sit back and put a little their thumbs. We let the, the lawyers are going to solve our problem for us. Well, you know, I think most of us know that that's a bunch of bull. Um, and um, so the point is, we're about organizing. We're not about going to court. If, if going to court can help us achieve our ends, well, that's all to the better. But, you know, the court, the 
is a function of the state. And the state is controlled by the, um, the ruling class. And so I know of a whole lot of experience, a whole lot of examples, starting with my the buildings I've lived in, as well as the buildings that I worked in, where we got jammed by the judge and, and the jury. Yeah, the jury is controlled by the judge nine times out of 10. So that's one reason and I can go into a bunch of, uh, you know, details and, and examples. But the other, so the, the bottom line is uh, tenants, tenant groups have a tendency to stop organizing and leave it up to the lawyer. So that's the worst thing that could possibly happen. So that's number one. Then the other reason is because of the particulars of what goes on at the, at the uh, you know, through that whole process, the court process. So, you know, everybody has uh, each tenant participating in a strike has a um, individual case and hopefully they will be, um, consolidated, but nevertheless, whether they are they are, or they don't, it, it, it all amounts to the same. Each individual tenant has to pay their rent, you know, by the fifth of the month or the first of the month or whatever it is, you know, and, and uh, if you don't, or if you are late, or if you, if you even five dollars short. Hey, Benito, Benito, sorry to interrupt. Your, your, your voice is fading out a little bit. So you need to like lean a little bit more into the computer if you can, just to make sure we can hear you more clearly. Whenever okay. you move, when you move back, Benito, we lose you. You're, you're moving too much. Okay. Um, so can you all hear me now? Yes. All right, so my, my point basically is that you lose people as a result of the, um, you know, the, the court process, the rent strike process for a whole lot of reasons, you know, and for one, one um, but, well, before the reasons I just laid out uh, without getting into a bunch of detail, but, you know, so like I said, so-and-so was $5 short and so-and-so, you know, was two days late. And so they had to go to court and explain what happened and they'll let you slide the first month, you know, but by, by the time it gets to the second, third, fourth time, that judge is going to throw your court, your case out of court. So you, for instance, at the park towers that, you know, one of the buildings I, I lived in, we started out with about a hundred people on strike. And before you know it, we was down to 80. Well, obviously, as Val Three said, it's all about strength and numbers. And if your um, tactics are leading to tenants getting knocked out of court, and now they got to make a um, an individual deal with the landlord to to accept three pieces of silver, you know, to move out. Well, now you're down to 99, then it's 98, and before you know it, it's 80, and without you that you don't go down any further. So if your tactics are gonna lessen the number of tenants on the strike, you are cutting into your own strength. And so anyway, those are like some, you know, things that we need to take in mind. And maybe there are other and better tactics. You know, like maybe, for instance, putting together a bunch of dead rats to bring down to the management office, or, you know, things of that nature, whatever the case may be. The point is, you're trying to organize tenants, and that means um, getting as many people as possible to participate in some kind of series of actions. And that is what is important, whether it's being on rent strike or, or dealing with the, the, the rat example 
or, you know, ambushing a landlord in a meeting, whatever it may be, the point is your purpose as an organizer and the tenants association purpose, I should hope, is to make sure that we augment and in, uh, continually increase the no, the amount, the number of part, people participating in the action, not take chances on losing folks. Anyway. Let me, let me just say, I, I, I go ahead, Linda. Thank you. I, I was just going to say, uh, rent strike was, uh, it was, was one um, tactic that I would use in organizing tenants. Uh, rent strike meaning that the the tenants will continue to pay their rent, but not right. who <laughs> the landlord. Yeah. We would have uh, someone to take their rent, and when we go to court, because the whole point was to get to court, and once we get to court, then we can uh, show <laughs> that residents have been paying their rent. However, the owners, the landlord, have not been following the law in maintaining the housing uh, conditions where they are supposed to, to be. So we have, we have in my organizing, have used the uh, rent strike as a tactic <laughs> to, to win our goals. I was going to add to that. I, I'm not a stake. I think as Benito is on rent strikes, and uh, I want to uh, reinforce what Linda just said is that an escrow account was set up where all the rents were paid in. Now you didn't necessarily need a lawyer to do that. You just set up an account in a bank and tenants could learn to do that and you'd need to have a third party escrow agent. But that created some economic power against the landlord. And in not all cases ended up in court. And one of the things that you used to set up a rent strike was to talk about the common code violations. So it wasn't just uh, apartment A has issues A, B, and C, right. you know, another apartment has issues D, E, and F. A lot right. of the code violations were common. And yes. So the Lord knows that there's money sitting in that account and that the way they're, they can either file in court and wait for the slow machinery of the court wheels to run, or they could kind of bait some of these violations and get the money in that account. So, I mean, it's obviously not the answer in every situation, but it can be an answer in some situations, particularly, I think, smaller buildings, smaller landlords where, um, you know, you have the common violations. And there were there was always plenty of things for tenants to do. In our case, we were law students. Um, and so we, you know, we were involved in the mechanics of setting it up. But we were also teaching the tenants how to do it uh, if the issue should arise in the future. And that's why I think it's important for those of you organizing is to develop associations with whenever possible free pro bono uh, legal advice, whether it's through law schools, whether it's through law firms to actually set hours aside for pro bono work um, or through you know legal cl clinics, that it's important to yeah. have that. But I, I as, a, as, as, a, as someone who practiced law, will be the first to say, try to avoid the legal process. It's, it's too bogged down, it's too complicated. And if you can exert economic pressure in other ways. Now, in terms of what the tenants could do, I mean, they could be documenting individual, um, uh, the code violations in the apartments. They could be taking pictures, they can be- Yeah, that's right. You know, there's a lot of things they can be doing while the, while the process is unfolding. But uh, again, tenant strike is not the answer to every problem, but I still think it's a viable tool. Let me just say, I agree with everything that both Linda and Beth just said. I'm, I'm simply saying that, you know, it's a complex process, uh, process and, um, you know, we, we need to be careful with what we do and as Beatrice just said as well, is the best thing we can do is to stay out of court. So, you know, and, and the use of escrow accounts, we've done that, we, we, you know, a, a, like a, quite a bit. And we help to, we try to develop financing, internal tenant association financing, 
so that uh, if somebody's going to be late, well, then the group has the money in place. But that is complex as well. And, you know, anyway, my point is, is that you, you have to have a variety. You need to, you need to lean in more to the computer. We can't, we still can't hear you well enough. You need to get a little closer to the mic if you can. And, and don't bob out, bob in. <laughs> yeah. Make sure your bob, face bob is totally in the, in the picture yeah. frame. Okay. Yeah, okay. So anyway, my only point is that we need to be flexible in terms of our tactics. Yeah, yeah, this is a great discussion. Thank you. Um, there's a lot of questions coming in. I also want to see if um, Awad and Mary have any particular questions they want to raise now um, as, as people who are actively involved in tenant organizing in the city now. Is there anything either of you want to raise? Should we go to the questions from the audience? What do you think? Absolutely. Well, first, before we get into the questions, I really want to thank Maria and Linda and Benito for being here and for the work that you've done. And I really want to celebrate the work that you've done because it is still reverberating through the activism and the organizing that we are doing today in 2022. And if it was not for your efforts, yeah. we would not have the protections and the rights and a lot of the systems in place that we have now to help protect tenants in DC. And so I really want to give you your flowers while we can. On top of that, um, I'm really curious to hear more, especially from you, Linda, about the origins of WISH, or what the earlier days were like in the initial organizing and kind of the intersection between the energy of DC in the early and mid 70s with the need for tenant organizing. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell me what drew you to tenant organizing and to sure. kind of form sure. it? Yes, yes. Well, you know, uh, WISH was formed, I think it might have been 77 or 78, something like that. That was before I was before I was a part of it. But I got involved with WISH through organizing in my building. <laughs> I lived in downtown DC. Oh, L Street, 919 L Street, <laughs> um, where there's a hotel now. But anyway, I was living there and the problem, and I started organizing because the owners of the property that was from Germany someplace would, were violating the code. And so uh, that was my beginning as a person who were directly impacted <laughs> by uh, a landlord not doing his work, not keeping up with the codes and, and not paying any attention to what the residents, the tenants had to say. And so I started organizing. At one point, I was out there by myself. I would go down to their bank <laughs> or their office and demonstrate by myself. But I, was, I, was, I had to keep my voice aloud and then I began to organize, you know, be able to bring in tenants from my property, L Street, 9th and L Street, uh, into uh, a, a, an association. And then as a result of that, we were reaching out to whatever kind of organization, association that was there to get assistance. And we finally were able to get assistance from Washington Inner City Self-Help, Paul Battle, <laughs> uh, who was the head of it then. He's, he's in Texas now. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so as a result of their assistance for me as a tenant, I was able to eventually, after we won, our uh, right to have uh, housing that was, <laughs> uh, you know, able, we were able to live in, I was able to get a job <laughs> at WISH and, on staff. And that was great because then I was out all over the place organizing tenants in low-income housing. That's what that's what that was our uh, uh, target. <laughs> so that's a little bit of my history. Yeah, I just want to thank uh, Awad for your comments, uh, um, and I also want to add to that that we all need to um, pa pass on or pass back. The, uh, the accolades to those folks that came before us. You know, so there are a bunch of organizers over the years that came before us. And for instance, 
I was trained as a, a student when I was still a student. I was trained by John Hampton, who um, was working with the uh, was an organizer with the National Tennis uh, Organization, the National Tennis Union or organization. I don't remember uh, something like that. Um, and so he trained me as, as an organizer. There was somebody else like Ernie um, Withers, not Ernie Withers, yeah, Ernie Withers, um, who was the president of the um, Envoy Towers Tenants Association here on 16th Street as well, and uh, was also the uh, president of, I don't remember the name, but some kind of tenant, uh, tenant group, not tenant association, but you know, an association of tenant associations that work together. And so all those people, you know, all those organizations build, built, you know, a base and we followed from that and, and y'all and perhaps some others, you know, um, are following from that. And then our, our grandkids will take up after us. And let me just say quickly that, uh, you know, I'm from St. Petersburg, Florida, and I was very much a part of the Black Power movement. <laughs> so I was one of those people who were out there from the very beginning, from, you know, the, the uh, 60s, all the way doing organizing. So I've, I've, been, I've been out here for a long time. <laughs> I think the intersection of racial justice and housing justice and economic justice go hand in hand. Absolutely. And it's still something that um, very much is working in tandem. I'm also curious to hear about what it was like dealing with language justice earlier on in those days when they did not have interpreters through the city mm -hmm. to translate um, for monolingual Spanish speakers or people who didn't even speak Spanish or English or, you know, monolingual Amharic speakers or Vietnamese, you know, we have a very diverse population here in the city. And as organizers, it's important to make sure that we can be as inclusive as possible when mm -hmm. dealing with Absolutely. tenants. Absolutely. And I would love to know what that was like for y'all. <laughs> I, I think it's important to say that uh, when we were organizing, well, just to reaffirm, I came from the Chicano movement in, in the Southwest, so uh, that's where I grew my, my roots. Um, but it was important when we were organizing to, we were all volunteers. And, and if for those of you that work through organizations can try to look for volunteers to join you, but we really try to represent the ethnicities and races of the buildings we were organizing. That was really important. And uh, in the Spanish speaking buildings, well, we were Spanish speakers. We had actually three of them that were organized. And then we, we did recruit a black person to assist us in other buildings. Um, now things are even more diverse. Uh, but I think it's really important to have your volunteers, your organizers, mayor to the extent, even if it's just to get a volunteer at a meeting uh, to mayor the people that you're representing. It's just someone that they can identify with. It's someone that they're going to more likely trust. Uh, and so that, that was really important. And then, um, you know, as, as, those, as different people started appearing in court, it finally got to the point to where the landlord tenant courts did provide uh, translators because that was necessary. But mm -hmm. those people, you know, into, into what was then, they, those were landlord hearings, which moved a little faster than the actual court. Yeah, well, one of the reasons uh, we, we uh, were organizing all over, what is this, Columbia Heights and Shaw, and so it was very mixed. That, that's one of the places that Benito came in that was very important because we were working with residents who just, most of the residents only spoke Spanish, but they had rights that they that we had to go in and let them know about, uh, like down here on um, uh, what is it W Street and uh, uh, T Street T Street, 
uh, where residents are still there. This was back in the uh, 80s, the 70s and the 80s. And we worked to make sure that the, the mixed, in, uh, mixed income and uh, mixed speaking residents were working together around the same goals. And that was critical to what we had to do. That's how come WISH had Spanish speakers and English speakers on board. Yeah, I would just add to what Linda just said uh, that, um, you know, I, I'm not so much familiar with the court process or the court, how, how the court started to have translators. Mm -hmm. But what I know is that in terms of city council hearings, um, uh, hearings before the DC, uh, what is it? D DC Department of Housing, um, DC, DCHD. I always get that. Yeah, community, yeah, Department of Housing and Community Development. And then DCRA as well. All of those agencies, as well as, as the, uh, what's the name, the city council, the way that all started, having having translators at those uh, hearings all started as a part of the work. I, and again, I don't like to, I'll, I'll just say it, but you know, um, a lot of that came about as a result of the work that WISH uh, and other groups, you know, did in terms of incorporating tenants in those, hearings. It used to be that, you know, the lawyer went to uh, the city council hearing, the lawyer spoke for the tenants, or the, the uh, director of whichever um, nonprofit uh, that was working with a group, they went down to the city council hearing, and they spoke for the tenants. No, they that. It's like lean in, lean in, Benito. Lean. Yeah, I'm, there. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. So I'm just saying later for all the other people talking for the tenants, like Linda said, let the tenants speak for themselves. So we would organize tenants, English speaking, Spanish speaking. Um, yeah, both. Yeah, um, I can't. I don't think I can speak about other languages, but. Um, yeah, but we didn't. Um, the The point is, is that uh, it was we brought we we got everyday tenants involved in this um, the hearing process, so that they would come down to speak for themselves, and then and we would prepare them, help them prepare their testimony. Uh, be it in English, Spanish, or orally, however it went down, because uh, some people couldn't uh, read and write, no matter what language. Uh, and so then um, the city council and, you know, these agencies um, are faced with a situation where, so what y'all gonna do? You gonna send these tenants home? Or are you gonna provide, um, um, what, what uh, translators for them, or are you going to allow us to translate? Mm -hmm. So obviously, it's like a variation on the theme of what Linda said and Bethany said earlier. You know, they don't really want to have us there, uh, especially if they, they, as the organizer, they damn sure don't want you there. Um, but they don't want the tenants there either. But they're there, you know. And so if they send you home. Everybody going to see that, you know, and, and the English speaking tenants are going to remember when it comes time to vote. Um, and so then after a while, you know, they decided it was uh, more politically correct and convenient, I should probably say, um, to, to, for the city council and DCRA and uh, housing community development to provide their own translators. So that in, 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 and of course, in an attempt to try to get you out as an organizer, try to get you out of the way 
and they look good before the, ten, the citizens that are getting ready to vote. Anyway. The other thing I wanted to add, uh, to focus more on organizing in buildings. I think it's really important, even if you can't get a face there that mirrors the ethnic or racial um, identity of your tenants, get, you know, a lot of people are going to be new immigrants and they're going to be worried about whether they're violating the law. So it's really important to get uh, whatever issues you're addressing, to get a nutshell summary of what their legal rights, to have no more than one page, to have that translated into the languages that are represented in the building. So even if you can't get an individual there, hopefully you can get that one page translated so that it can be passed out. Because uh, and so that they'll know that if they're going to do something like withhold rent and put it in an escrow account, that they're within their legal rights to do that. And for them to sit in paper and there's said you can even add a little reference to the statute that gives them that right. It just gives them a little more comfort and confidence. And I and I think it's so important to to do that. Absolutely. I think speaking on what you're just talking about, that goes directly into a question that I saw in the Q&A. Um, from Clara Lincoln, my colleague at the LEDC, who mm -hmm. uh, specifically asked, uh, she would love to hear the panelists advice for dealing with buyouts. When tenants are caught between the choice to build wealth for their families and staying in affordable housing, I know that currently we are finding more and more tenants interested in buyouts and nothing else. Um, you were just talking about, you know, these newer immigrant families and when they're presented with the opportunity to you know get bought out by a developer or a landlord for you know five thousand ten thousand fifteen thousand dollars to move from where they live to who knows yeah. what um a lot of yeah. times those families will take that buyout and just go back home because that's now wealth that they can use back in their home country or wherever, or a lot of times they'll take that and just go and find anywhere else to live, but that versus the affordable housing aspect of it. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Well, let me just say one thing about um, a buyout where I, 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 like I say, I used to live at um, 9th and L Street. Uh, and when they were getting ready to, and it was a co-op, we had worked hard there to, uh, you know, forced the, the landlord to sell because we gave them such a hard time fighting them back. So they eventually sold the property to the residents and it became a cooperative. But um, as uh, I was one of the, the leading tenants and one of the leading co-op owners down at Ninth and L. And when I left, I left because I created another cooperative that was what, what we call intentional community, which was for specifically for community organizing. So I left L Street Cooperative and went to where I am now. The Ella Jo Baker Intentional Community is where I am now. But nonetheless, it, with the people at Ninth and L, the, um, that uh, what is it? That hotel came in and offered people a whole lot of money to move out. And on the one hand, my heart was broken because I didn't want them to move and lose those low, low, lower income housing. But on the other hand, they came in and they offered people like seventy and eighty thousand dollars. And I said, "Whoa, people never." <laughs> had that much money so you know i was i was pulled on both ends go ahead and, and get the money and and find another place and also stay there so that was a a real serious kind of pull on my heart that i had but eventually of course folks finally took the money uh and moved out and actually to tell you the truth, some of the people who got that $70,000 wind up being homeless. Even today, that, and that was back in the uh, 80s sometime. Even today, one person that I keep running into still have not been able to have a you know stable place to live. So anyway, that was my experience. <laughs> we fell out. 
Yeah, I mean, that, that, you know, I agree absolutely with what Linda just said. And it's like building after building. Uh, I don't care whether it's African American or Salvadorian or any other nationality of people, you know, you always run into the same thing. And when the landlord is trying to sell that building, he gonna do, I say he, but it is gonna do anything and everything required to empty that building. And if that means offering money, so you offer $10,000 and people say F you, uh, and then you come back with 13, then you come back with 15, then you come back with 20 or 30 or whatever the case may be. I don't, I didn't know of a case of 70, but you know, I mean, hey, look, you know, I, it's absolutely conceivable. And guess what? If they offer $100,000 or more and the tenants still don't, um, uh, accept the move out money. Well, there are the means. Landlord is a capitalist. Capitalists have every means under the sun. And so, for instance, they got arson. They got drug dealers. They got drug dealer gangs. They got all kinds of gangs. You know, they got prostitutes. You know, everything under the sun to make life unbearable for the folks that's right to force them out and, and then i just want to yeah, say yeah yeah go ahead here right around the corner from where we are now in columbia heights there have been times when landlord was sent in drug dealers they the, the landlord sent in drug dealers to the, to frighten everybody and to give them the landlord the reason for shutting down the property right here in columbia Heights, around the corner <laughs> where we are now i remember fighting against that kind of move by landlords to send in to send in folks to sell drugs and to do that kind of uh you know efforts and and experience so that people would you know be forced so that they could have a reason to shut down and close it out and then open it up for a high income condominium <laughs> yeah, that, question, that question raises really the, the the issue of why it's so important that when you're doing tenant organizing that you not only are talking about organizing within respective buildings, but that it's important to take a more global approach. When we were organizing, we considered Hilda Mason our friend and we tried to share some of the experiences. She was on the city council. Mm -hmm. You know, the tenants best, all that you can do is try to have them stay as informed as possible about what the options are short term and long term, and to make, right. get them involved in, in the more global approach to stopping gentrification and yes. to, if buildings are going to come in, to put the pressure to make sure that units are set aside for low and middle income people that you just don't yield that you so it's it's so important to 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 make the the struggle a global one in addition to a local one and to try to connect the two but clearly the tenant has to do what is in their in their best interest all that you can do is to give them help them see a clear picture of long-term and short-term effects of what their what option they decide to select yes yes yeah, yeah, i need to lean in we can't hear you yeah, yeah, yeah. i'm sorry I, I agree with what both linda and beatrice just said the, the, uh, i would just add to that that you know it all comes down to education and beatrice just spoke to this some you know, um, we have part of our job as an organizer, one of the most important jobs of the organizer is to educate folks. So, okay, so you just got offered $70,000. You ain't never seen no $70,000 in your own damn life. You know, what you gonna do with $70,000? You don't even know what that looked like. 
you know, um, but like Linda said, there's a dude she knows to, to this day that ain't still be, been able to, uh, you know, find some place to stay. Why? You know, every case is uh, different a little bit. But when you get 20000 30000 whatever amount of money in your hand, that looks, and you ain't never had that before, it looks like you, that's never ending. Yeah. So then you're going to give your brother this much and your sister that much and your mom this much and your dad this much and your uncle and this. And before you know it, in a few months, you ain't got no money, you know. And that's why people end up with no place to stay. Um, so partly, uh, you know, it's about, um, well, let me, but my point, my basic point here is, you know, in the labor movement, they use a word called inocu uh, inoculating. So when you're getting ready to uh, go on a rent strike campaign or uh, a regular worker strike campaign, you know that the boss is going to come down with a million tactics. Uh, you know, they're going to come down with a million tactics to scare folks and this and that. For instance, the um, Bessemer strike in Alabama a few months ago, um, Amazon, um, the Kellogg strike just, you know, five minutes ago, um, and on down the line, the part of the job of the union, you can call it a, a regular worker union or a tenant union, call it what you want, you know, whatever it might be, but you have to inoculate your folks so that they understand and they have in their mind uh, uh, their responses to all of these millions of offers. You know, so you can agree to this, you can agree to that, but the bottom line is in five minutes, you ain't gonna have no money, uh, you know. And you need to understand the mechanics and the economics involved as to why those 20,000 or whatever amount ain't gonna last you but 20 days. I, I think in a nutshell, many just well, one of Benito's points is that it's important that the tenants understand that their specific issues, their uh, landlord issue, their renters issue is it fits into a larger, more global picture of economics. I, I do think you need to be careful what terms you use because <laughs> there, there are a lot of uh, trigger terms out there that turn people out, but you can explain things in a way to where their issue fits into a much bigger picture. Uh, and that's important from the very beginning of organizing, that you're not just target, targeting an isolated tenant issue, that you place that in the larger economic picture of the building, of the city, of the country, and even of the, and of the globe. And of the globe, exactly. Absolutely. I'm wondering, are there, can you all give examples of how you did that in your organizing, you know, ways that you were trying to um, connect this very local work, you know, somebody doesn't want to lose their apartment, <laughs> you know, but how you're connecting that to, to bigger questions. I remember bringing in um, articles and I think, God, it's so long ago, I, I told you I did the math, it was 48 years ago. I remember being in touch with the tenant organization, I think in Detroit, or something, and they would send us information so that the uh, tenants in DC know that the same battles were being uh, waged halfway across the country, and we would share their successes and their stories with tenants in the building, and that was one of the ways that we um, connected them. And even in California, there were things going on in California. There were rent control uh, battles going on across the country, and we brought those um, to tenants uh, that we were organizing and working with, so they knew that they were one of many. 
Yeah, and and you know, I I went to uh, South Africa <laughs> um, to uh, work to to teach people how to organize and own their own property. Right, right after the right at the end of the quote unquote apartheid, um, I was one of the people to go over and to teach people how to own their own property, and uh, had a a great experience with that and i think um i and they're still going you know that was that was a a, a good thing but it was the whole point was <laughs> because what was going on here the same thing was happening in south africa and the organizing that i was doing here in, in uh, the us in in washington dc was the same organizing that i did once i went to uh south africa uh and went from one end of south africa to the other <laughs> uh to teach people how to uh own their own property how to create cooperative how to create tenant associations and how to stand up for their rights and fight for their their rights even though it was the end of apartheid but that was a different story yeah how would you say no, go, go ahead. ahead. Uh, no, no, know, go ahead. I remember during that period of time, what Linda said reminded me, we were not just involved in tenant strike. And I remember that there was um, there was the part, the, the, the free Mandela movement was going on and <laughs> marching against Riggs Bank, who, who was who had holdings. Uh, and we would share our experiences in the meetings with other things that we had been doing. Uh, even with when when Cesar Chavez was organizing in the Southwest, I had been involved with that movement, and I shared those experiences. They weren't tenants, they were farm workers, but it, they were some of the same issues that it was necessary to create and to and and that numbers were important and to exert economic power against people. So there were there were ways to tie those struggles together. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I would just add that. Um in terms of inoculating folks that um, you know a lot of folks don't know how to read and write or they might theoretically know how to read and write but they are functionally illiterate and even if they ain't even if they can read and write better than anyone here on this panel um folks don't necessarily know when you say that this $70,000 ain't going to last you but 70 days. It's hard for folks to picture that in their mind. So part of educating slash inoculating is to, you're on a blackboard because you're in a meeting or you might be in somebody's house one-on-one, -on -one, whichever case. Um, you need to use mathematics how much do you make and you might not want to tell me but write it down for yourself you know how much do you spend in a month how much is left over now you got this extra amount of money what you're going to use it for and let people and again you're not trying to pry into nobody's business but you let people jot down on their own piece of paper or in their mind if if they can't write, um, so that they can see, they can figure out for themselves when you leave out of that apartment, you know, they can sit with their lady or their husband, whatever, uh, and, um, and they can figure out. What are we gonna use this $70,000 for? How much is it gonna last us? And what is the best, use that we could give to that and that's one side of it these crazy um organizers coming in here telling us how we can own a building we can't even pay the damn rent they talking about buying the building um you know so it's important to make that real we have to educate folks so that they can come to understand where you're going to get the money from and what is the process that we have to go through. 
And part of that inoculation is you have to get ready to be able to go and be willing to go to a thousand city council, DCRA, DHCD hearings for the next three years. So we can get so we can drive the city crazy. So because we in their face constantly in order to basically pressure them to give up the money so that we can accomplish our purpose, uh, our purchase. So people need to understand that concretely in their lives. Well, how that where are we going to get the money from? And what do we have to do to get it? Hmm. You know, I think um, there's a lot of really interesting points that are being raised and um, a bunch of things have been said about um, in particular this potential relationship between the labor movement and tenant organizing. And I, I think a, there's a, so many good questions that have come up in the Q&A. Everybody, if you click on Q&A, you can see them. Um, I hope, I'm not sure we'll be able to get to all of them, but um, I did just wanna ask a couple of things. One, um, you know, Beatriz, you were talking about solidarity and, I, and, and Linda, both of you talking about learning from other places um, and, and trading and making those connections with other tenants in Detroit and California and South Africa. Um, and, and really just kind of learning from each other. And, and Beatriz, as part of that, you were talking about the, the struggle for rent control, which was going on around the country at the time in different places, um, certainly was going on here in DC. We had a question come up about how, um, one of the earlier questions had to be, how do we as, as DC residents make sure rent control stays in place? So sort of as an ongoing effort. Um, so I, it would be interesting to hear about anyone's thoughts on kind of the struggle to strengthen and expand rent control that's going on right now. So that's one question. And the other is this question, the uh, latest one here, um, which I'll read, speaking of the growing labor movement, would any of the panelists wanna share any thoughts on how they think greater synergy could be fostered right now between those doing housing organizing, labor organizing and racial justice efforts? You all seem to be kind of getting to that right now. Any, any explicit advice around that? Somebody. <laughs> Somebody want to go first because I'm going to hit it. <laughs> hit it, but don't move out of the picture. We need to hear all of your words. Every time I really you really want to hear you. You know, you have the FLCIO. Uh, this may be a controversial statement to some people. I don't care. Um, but I, I personally don't know of any organization large mass people's organization that does more to foster um, labor union unity. Uh, and here in DC for, for in particular, you know, with regard to um, African-American workers and Latino workers, uh, Ethiopian workers, et cetera, Chinese, um, so that, that's number one, but we can extend that. It's not just the AFL-CIO, it's all, all the people's organizations today. Fading, fading. They need to lean in, lean in, yeah. yeah. All the people's organizations in general, and, and I mentioned AFL-CIO, but all of them uh, understand very concretely uh, how necessary it is to build uh, unity amongst the the Af the, the uh, working class, uh, all nationalities, uh, all races, all cultures, you know, et cetera, et cetera, and they are working towards those ends. But in particular, I could say because I could go on. Um, I would suggest, and I have suggested uh, over the years, that uh, in terms of building the unity amongst those folks that are doing uh, labor organizing, tenant organizing, it's the same folks in a whole lot of cases. And it's the, the AFL, the CIO, for instance, here in DC, the Metro Washington Council, that was the basis of the rent control movement back in the 70s. 
Rick Powell. Yeah, local 25. You know, here, H-E-R-E, hotel workers and restaurant workers. He later went on to be second in, in command of the Metro Council. You know, he was the backbone uh, for creating the, uh, what's the name? The uh, city, what was it? Citywide Housing Coalition. That was the main organization that um, pushed and accomplished the first rent control bill. So again, it's labor that is the basis of all these other um, struggles and movements, you know. And as some of you know, you know, I've been, uh, or I, I ain't been doing it lately, but, uh, you know, <laughs> for years I um, advocated for, um, where the tenants need to get their, or tenant groups, not tenant groups, tenant associations, but the sponsor organizations such as WISH, such and, and many others, you know, LEDC, where do we need to get our money from so that we can organize tenants? We're used to going to uh, these foundations and these foundations, I mean, that's cool, but, um, they are also quick to tell you what your limits are. So if you tell tenants to do this, and if you do that, you ain't going to have no um, funding when, when September comes. Um, so my um, response to that, and the labor union's response to that, people, you know, is we need to have organizations that uh, are, it's like Bernie Sanders, uh, you know, our organization is based on small donations, small people donations. And then on top of that, the tenant movement needs to go to the, to the, to the AFL-CIO and put together a proposal to get some money. Another example, that's just in general. Yes, but I know right now. You're fading. Lean in, Benito. Okay, I'm sorry. I know that right now, for instance, um, Jobs with Justice, DC Jobs with Justice, which is a function of the Metro Council, um, has a rent control campaign. You know, the, the two, two demands. Uh, number one, is to uh, extend the rent freeze during COVID because it just expired at the end of December. And number two, just to, to um, how shall I put it? I mean, uh, bring back rent control. We need a new rent control uh, law. And again, that is coming from the initiative of labor. Not nobody else. Anyway, let me be cool. Other thoughts on that? Thank you, Benito. That relationship between labor and tenant organizing. And I like how you brought it to rent control too. Yeah, and I would just say, remember, tenants are workers 99%. Uh, that we all work. Yeah, we you just, guys are touching. Y'all are Hi, touching Mary. such good stuff. Um, you know, I wanted to circle back to the concept of how land ownership and private property is a system that was born out of white supremacy and colonialism, and how it's important for marginalized people to. Do take power back in those areas. Um, I wanted to ask y'all how you think systemic change happens and the intersection of the grassroots organizing and legislative change and how you see the role of music and art and cultural workers play into that too. And Beatrice, I know you were talking the other day about um, how you helped draft the TOPA legislation. And I would love to hear you talk more about that too. 
Um, yeah, I, God, there's so many issues. I, I, I think, you know, as Benito said, you know, your workers are your renters and so your renters are, should be just as involved with Black Lives Matter and the, the intersection is there. It's just how do you unite the power behind it? Um, you know, it's, it's interesting as I sit up here in isolated, very white Trump country, up New York in the upper rim of the Adirondacks. And um, some, of the, some of the ways that I try to not die <laughs> is uh, to try to keep up with Bernie Sanders grassroots organizing group. You know, he, he has people that are still meeting who are, who are out there electing local officials in, in city positions, school board positions, uh, party positions, you know, they're out there, out there doing it and, and, you know, to use whatever forums you can to raise, you know, those issues, uh, even if you are as isolated as I am, you know, uh, some of these grassroots meetings are on Zoom nationwide where you have two or 3,000 people on, on the Zoom call at one time and, and to utilize whatever, whatever forums are there. And, and um, there, there are forums, uh, it, where, wherever all of us are, that we can try to talk about the intersection of all of these issues. Um, you know, there's not a lot of black people up here, um, but I found out that at the college, at the university in Plattsburgh, there is a group on racial healing. Um, there are a lot of, there's Native Americans up here and to try, and th th there is an effort to try to bring those groups together to talk about some of these issues uh, because within these groups are tenants and there are uh, wage earners and there are people out there who have issues that, that intersect. Um, in terms of the experience drafting the rent control regulations, you know, we did that. Uh, Roisman, who was the, one of the lawyers who drafted what came to be called rent control, she utilized her, uh, some of us in class to draft the regulations, and it helped that we had experience. It, it was it was like taking a, a criminal law course at the same time that you're interviewing. Uh, people who are going to be at arraignment the next morning, which actually Antioch Law School did. That was wonderful. Well, you were learning the black letter law. You were representing indigent people. And the same for rent. when we were drafting some of the rent control regulations, we were organizing some of the buildings. So some of the issues that we were that we were deal, were addressing with, we could try to to have um, include in, in, in some of the, the rent control regulations. In terms of the specifics, God, it was so long ago. I don't remember the specifics, uh, but I'm glad to hear Benito say, I, again, I've been out of DC for several years now, um, that people, st that there is still a fight and there are still people waging that fight to keep rent control um, because that is so important. Uh, I'll let someone else speak at, at that issue. But it's a good question um, that you raise. Any other thoughts on that question of Mary's about really about the sort of intersection of this, um, these different kinds of organizing? And also, yeah, I, I really appreciated Mary's question too about ways that like culture and art and music can be used to help organize? Oh, there's no question. Benito, I see your WPFW shirt and Mary and I, uh, we have a radio show on 94.3 FM. And so we know the power of community radio um, and how integral it is to communities. Can you tell me a little bit about how radio and music has intersected with your organizing work at all? Um, well, Amanda just spoke to it in a way. Um, and you just spoke to it. Um, 
I know that I don't know if it still exists, but uh, Empower DC, for instance, which is the stepchild of Wish, um, had or has a show on PFW. Um, and now you got a show. Um, and there are other examples of that. You know, I mean, we have to get the word out. You know, in the same way, the, the Metro Council has a, has, has a show on PFW every Thursday at one o'clock where they talk about the, uh, str the labor struggles that are going on, you know, at that day. And they interview uh, people that are on strike or whatever other kind of struggle they on. And I'm sure you're doing the same thing. And uh, Empower DC does or was doing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So these are different ways, you know, that we use because we have to get the word out, you know. The same thing applied in newspapers, et cetera, you know. But, no, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, even though I can't hear you. I was just going to say, even though it's been a long time, I, there, uh, way, way back, way back in the day, I was uh, on uh, a radio show. I forget what station it was, but I remember. Uh, talking about organizing. That was the whole point yeah. of the radio show that I was hosting. And um, the, it's been very important. In fact, um, a couple of weeks ago, I was about with January 6th, I was interviewed by um, a person at uh, WPFW uh, around um, that January 6th. Uh, <laughs> the January 6th insurrection. Uh, but the, the radio have been very, very important to Linda, we can't hear you. Linda, we can't hear you very well. Maybe you can really? move a little bit more um, into the screen a little bit. Okay. <clears throat> I'm sorry. No, I, okay. I'm sorry. I was just saying that I have had experience uh, being on radio shows and hosting radio shows and um, around issues that I have organized around for many, many, many years. And, you know, I just also want to mention that both Benito and Linda um, also have been involved in um, writing and helping publish community newspapers um, in the 70s. <laughs> Linda had a newspaper um, that her group of women who were working on anti-violence against women um, right. And that was a new, it was up front. Is that right? Am I remembering that? Correctly? Yeah, sure. Wow. I'm, yeah. I didn't know you uh, was familiar with that. But yes, up front was a, a right, a newspaper. I, that's when I was out doing work for anti violence against women work in the streets. And that was part of what we had to do was put out this newspaper up front. And um, yes. Wow, didn't know you were familiar, aware well, of that. We, we talked about it a little bit in our oral history interview, but I would love to learn more. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, and then Benito was also involved with the with the uh, newspaper ads Morgan called the um, Noticiero Colombian, um, which was yeah. a bilingual community newspaper in Adams Morgan. And I just, you know, there's, and just, we only have five minutes left. I'm so sad that we have to wrap up this discussion at 1230. But just to say that, um, you know, that newspaper, you know, I've read it. It's it's at the DC Public Library. Any of us can go to the DC Public Library and read old back issues of this newspaper from the 1970s that is documenting in like incredible detail these struggles. You yeah, know, these tenant struggles, but also all sorts of other different kinds of struggles going on in the city at the time. Um, and right. Benito was a part of that. Um, and, and, and all of you were involved in in this work um, that I think. Yeah, it comes back to like, how do we document it? And then how do we, you know, make sure it's still, um, you know, is communicated this history to today and, and relevant and, and helps folks who are organizing today. Yeah, so. it, it, when I was a part of Empower DC, at the very beginning, we had a, a, new, a newspaper. It's, they still have a, a newsletter, I think it is, but we had a newspaper. Um, Linda, we can't really hear you very well. If you can like move more mm -hmm. into the, there you oh, go. I'm sorry. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. We we had a um, 
back in the day, we had a, a newspaper at, at um, Wish and eventually in Power DC. And there are still copies at the uh, MLK library. And I think, I think um, Amanda, you, you went there and kind of organized it and got it in shape, but at the, um, the uh, MLK library that's at, uh, I think it's at UDC. Yeah, but if people are interested in seeing some of those newsletters, um, newsletters and newspaper, they can go there and, and look at uh, some of those copies. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah, it's the Washington Inner City Self-Help Papers. It's a collection in the community archives at MLK Library downtown. So that's, um, that's available to the public to look at. Yes. We have just a couple minutes left. Um, I thought, you know, this this all stemmed from an oral history project. And I'm curious if um, anyone and, you know, this series, we're, we're, this Humanities DC, I'm so grateful that they have sponsored these projects and that they put together this or asked us to do this panel together today. I'm wondering if anyone has any um, final thoughts on um, the power of oral history as a method for learning about the past um, and communicating that to the present. I think that it's through oral histories like that that you uh, connect us that are older than dirt with those of you young ones that are still out there with a the struggle. And, and I find that helpful. And I'd like to continue conversations with those faces that I see that really warm my heart that you're out there and you know doing the things that we were trying to do so many years ago. And that's one of the benefits of oral histories is it makes these connections. Yeah, and I would just say that, remember that to this day, there's a bunch of folks out there who are illiterate, but completely illiterate, you know, and so therefore that oral history is the, and you know, is the best form, the only form of education uh, for that, those populations. So I don't know of anything that could be more important. You know, I mean, some of us can get on the internet and some others, you know, you can go to go to the bookstore, but some folks, that's the, the oral communication is their only means. Let me just say, thank you for the invitation to share, <laughs> orally to share. I appreciate it, thank you. I second the motion. <laughs> I, I third it. <laughs> well, I am so incredibly grateful to the three of you for participating in this project. Um, and, um, you know, maybe we can talk about extending it in the future, doing more interviews, interviewing more people. Um, I think it's just so important to really understand the incredibly rich history, you know, that we have in this city of tenant organizing, but also so many other kinds of organizing. Um, and I'm also so grateful to Awad and Mary for the work you're doing now and for joining us and with your, for your awesome questions. I just think it's been such a great discussion. Amanda, can you send an email if no one objects to the participants and phone numbers uh, so that we can connect to each other? I second that motion as well. We will connect, <laughs> definitely. I would love it. Thank you so much for having us be a part of this. I, it's been a highlight of my week. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you all so much for being for, here. That Thank goes you. for me as well. Thank you. Thanks. Absolutely. I appreciate it. Thank you to everyone for coming um, and for your great questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to all of them, um, but thank you so much for, for being part of this discussion to everybody who is here. We really appreciate you um, taking the time to be part of it. And again, thank you so much to all the panelists. It's just been a very inspiring hour and a half. Yeah, uh, thank you to y'all for putting it together. Thank you, Amanda, for everything that you have done. <laughs> Thanks, thank Amanda. Thank you, Linda. <laughs> All right. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye -bye. Have a wonderful Saturday Have an afternoon. Weekend. Take care. Have thank a good you. Day, everybody.